This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, Communications Director at Feinberg. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color in the U.S. with higher rates of hospitalization and death. Mercedes Carnathon, a Northwestern medicine epidemiologist and a population science expert, is here to talk about this troubling fact and what can be done to help these vulnerable communities as the pandemic continues and vaccine rollout lags behind. Dr. Carnathon is the vice chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine here at Feinberg and has studied the risk factors of chronic disease for more than 18 years. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you very much for having me. You know, you were on our first episode of this podcast almost exactly three years ago, if you can believe that. (laughs) It's amazing. We had you on to talk. Isn't that amazing? Time flies. And um, that's when we could be together in the studio. We had you on to talk about health disparities. And I would love for you to refresh our memories about the breadth of your research and what drives you to do this important work. Yes, thank you for calling to mind that uh, opening discussion that we had three years ago, because it really is very relevant to where we sit right now in discussing disparities in COVID-19. So my research throughout my career has focused on risk factors and consequences of cardiovascular diseases. And when I describe what that means, when I think about risk factors for developing cardiovascular diseases. I'm quite often studying and talking about the health behaviors and choices that we make, as well as how the environments we live in both drive those choices and are associated with our risk for developing cardiovascular diseases. In the time since we spoke in Uh, three years ago, I have broadened beyond cardiovascular diseases to also include lung diseases, um, which is why it was quite fortuitous when the COVID-19 pandemic really struck us that I felt I was ideally situated given my background and research in risk factors for the very chronic conditions that were predisposing to worse outcomes in COVID and despair and in my background in studying the disparities in those, it, it seemed to align really well for me being able to help out in studying the COVID-19 pandemic. Which lung diseases were you focusing on in your research? Who were you collaborating with? I have a secondary appointment in the Department of Medicine and Division in Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, where I collaborate with uh, Dr. Ravi Kalhan in trying to identify the evolution of lung health across the life course in young adults. So in particular, how do the behaviors that we know um, predispose to the development of other chronic conditions, such as physical activity, sleep, even diet, how do those influence not just the cardiovascular diseases that I had built my career studying, but how does that influence the development of chronic lung conditions, such as um, obstructive pulmonary disease, which is the fourth leading cause of death in most years, and how it influences obesity, which what we're finding is that obesity appears to be really a a central point of the risk factors that are leading to uh, more severe outcomes in people who contract COVID. Yeah, obesity has been a focus of some of uh, your recent research. You published several papers about Black adults and early onset diabetes. In a, stub- in a study published in JAMA in 2018, your team found that obesity is the main reason why Black adults have double the rate of diabetes compared to white adults by midlife. Tell me a little bit, what is driving this obesity problem? It's a, it's a broad question, I know. Um, what are some of the factors? No, I'm glad you bring those up because I think they have um, increasingly been called to light as of late. Um, you know, we, we think about conditions such as uh, developing obesity as something that may be under an individual's control. So can't we just tell people to um, eat eat better diets and exercise more and sleep more. And if they could just do those things, they could prevent the likelihood of developing obesity. But adopting those behavioral changes is really only possible for people whose 
you know, social and personal situations allow them the luxury of having enough money to be able to purchase uh, healthy uh, vegetables and fruits versus processed foods, which are cheaper, that allows them the ability to join a gym. You know, I've started exercising outdoors right now, but I'm looking outside in, in weather that we're having now in January, thinking, eh, I don't know that I want to run over snow and ice, but, you know, thankfully I have the resources to be able to join a gym, but in, individuals don't have that. I have a, a job that is salaried that I can set my own hours. So I'm not waking up or having, you know, in the middle of the night to go to two jobs and other people don't have that luxury. And so I think our attention about the root causes of obesity has rightly shifted upstream to the social and physical environments in which individuals live. And I think in our last conversation, uh, you had the opportunity to ask questions of my colleague, Dr. Kiari Kershaw, whose work is on those neighborhood level determinants of chronic diseases. Well, and right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, when a lot of gyms aren't open and a lot of options are not available, it just compounds the problem even more, makes it more obstacles for people to, you know, obtain better health. Yeah, completely. And right now people are finding themselves needing to make a trade-off between do I feel safe exercising indoor in a gym when, you know, we've got a pandemic going on or do I take the trade off and, you know, not exercise for a little bit? But the grand irony here is that to the extent that you can, you know, be as healthy as possible, maintaining your weight, controlling your blood pressure, controlling your diabetes, the likelihood of a severe outcome from COVID is theoretically lower. You know, we, we don't know for sure why some individuals have a, you know, an extreme inflammatory response that leads to the hospitalizations and even death. But what we do know from epidemiologic data are that individuals who are obese have hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney diseases, heart disease, and severe asthma are more likely to have adverse outcomes. Well, yeah, take me back. Take me back to last year and those early days and weeks of the pandemic. At what point did you realize non-whites and ethnic minorities in the U.S. would be the most affected by COVID-19? Uh, yeah, I would say that realization came to me very early on. And that's because when we saw the initial data coming out of China, followed quickly by data coming out of Italy, because as you recall, Italy was about six weeks ahead of us in the course of the pandemic. And descriptive papers came out very quickly showing who was most likely to die. And it was clear at the outset that individuals with those chronic cardiovascular or and metabolic diseases, and by metabolic diseases, I'm referring to obesity, diabetes, hypertension and chronic kidney disease, it was very clear that those individuals did worse. And when I thought very immediately about how those conditions are disproportionate in our population by metrics such as uh, socioeconomic status, so income, education level, race and ethnicity, I immediately knew that we would see these problems. Just to follow up, I, you know, it surprised me a little bit that the problems were as severe, if not more severe than what we saw in Europe and Asia, because my bias at the outset was in thinking that in other um, cultures, multi, multi-generational families were more likely to share a household. Uh, than they are here in the United States. But you think about it, in certain cultures here in the United States, multi-generational households are common. And it just so happens that many of those same communities where you do have grandparents in the same household as their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren, those same communities who are more likely to have those multi-generational households are more likely to share risk factors such as obesity and diabetes. And then sure enough, as we saw into the spring and summer, that's exactly what happened. And it was these uh, communities, non-white, other people of color who were having higher rates of hospitalization and death. And 
July 20th, 2020, you were called upon as a witness for a Senate Special Committee on Aging to share your observations and recommendations on the pandemic and older adults who were also in that risk group there of vulnerable communities. Tell me about that event. What did you discuss? What did you recommend to the committee at that time? That was a really unique experience because as an epidemiologist, I'm, I'm used to speaking with academic audiences. At times, I'm called on to speak to lay audiences, but I had never had the opportunity to speak with a, a governing body that would be in a position of setting policies related to our health. And so that was a, it was a great experience and an honor. In preparation for that, I did a little research. So as you mentioned, I knew what we were seeing broadly in the community related to disparities. I could extrapolate that those disparities were certainly happening in adults who were ages 65 and older, which is typically the definition for older adults. However, there are some unique scenarios for older adults that I wanted to carefully consider as I made my recommendations. And that is the use of nursing homes. You know, we knew early on and we saw this, that there were higher rates of death in congregate care settings. Uh, Congregate care settings being nursing homes, places where individuals live together in groups outside of small um, uh, households. And it turns out that nursing homes that served a large proportion of minority residents were doing worse than nursing homes that served a different socioeconomic clientele. And, you know, that's a very, very troubling statistic because what you would hope, given that nursing homes are regulated, is that, for example, cleaning standards would be the same. Um, You would hope that policies that were set to protect residents of one nursing home could also protect residents of another nursing home. But but what the reality showed was something different. It showed that even in these settings where you would hope care and policies could be standardized, we saw huge disparities in the number of residents who were affected. And part of that really had to do with the background rates in the community um, and how the individuals who worked in those nursing homes may have lived in the surrounding communities, how visitors to and from those nursing homes were coming from the communities that were hardest hit. And I think that really alarmed me, which was to say um, that the disparities that we see at the community level were being replicated within our health serving organizations, uh, such as a congregate care setting. You were able to share this information with the Senate because you wanted to get some new recommendations out there, different ways to think about um, really where funding can go, right, to to help this this problem. Um, I recall one of my recommendations um, was related to the funding needed by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, The NIH is by far our largest funder of biomedical research. And the initial stimulus package went most heavily to providing supplemental funding to the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And that made a lot of sense given that's the branch that would be addressing transmission of an infectious disease and even the development of vaccines. However, in my recommendation, Um, I I brought up that the individuals who were doing the worst were those who were coming in with diabetes, with cardiovascular diseases, and that those fall under the domain of two different institutes, uh, the National Institute for Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Disorders, and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And obviously, the Institutes on Institute on Aging and the Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities had an equally vested interest in the patterns that we were seeing. So one of my recommendations was to... Um, direct funding towards these other institutes. And I had the opportunity this fall to reiterate that when I testified to the National Disability Forum, which is part of the Social Security Administration in talking about how chronic conditions were leading to long haul COVID 
uh, disproportionately in some groups as compared with others. And now here we are today, we finally have vaccine rollout, and but there's still challenges that exist even now to ensure that non-whites and ethnic minorities are getting vaccinated. You know, what measures can be taken to better communicate and distribute the vaccine to these communities right now? I have to say when people describe, you know, their professional disappointments and their professional pain. I, I think that this is certainly one of mine, and that's that we see the highest rates of vaccine hesitancy in the communities who are hardest hit by COVID-19. Um, it really breaks my heart, frankly, because uh, you know we're seeing Black communities far less likely to be willing to accept a vaccine. And this you know, is one of the communities that is experiencing the greatest burden, along with Native American Indians, certain Asian subpopulations. Um, and so it, it really does hurt. So this vaccine hesitancy and differential willingness to take vaccines is not new. Um, There are data coming from influenza vaccination that show similar patterns of mistrust about vaccines, whereby black adults and other minority adults are less likely to accept those vaccines. And I'm not deliberately ignoring other large minority population groups such as Latinx or Asian um, Americans, but we happen to have Uh, less data on those groups. And quite often those data are aggregated in a way that doesn't respect the substantial heterogeneity within the Latinx community and within the Asian American community. Um, So many of my remarks will refer to the data that I've seen in blacks as compared with whites. There are national campaigns uh, coming from the National Medical Association and other minority serving medical organizations to really try to get the word out about vaccination and about why it is important for every individual to do so that we can protect one another. The Office of Behavior and Social Science Research at the National Institutes of Health is really taking a lead on this and you know, promoting community-based Uh, question and answer sessions and opportunities not only to preach at people and tell them why they should be vaccinated, but to really listen to the reasons why people are expressing uncertainty about vaccination. Because quite often, you know, we take this position coming out of academia of telling people what they should do rather than asking them what their concerns are so that we can address those more specifically and directly. And you'll be following those statistics as they come in? Oh, definitely. And, you know, and the, and the reason why following those statistics of who is vaccinated is important, is an important piece of public health surveillance is it allows us to predict where we will continue to see problems. Because, you know, if, if entire, if in, if in one community, of people choose vaccination, the overall risk of new people in that community becoming infected goes down as compared with a community where only 20% of people are willing to be vaccinated. And if we were okay with accepting that, that would be one thing. But, you know, there are no gates around communities. There are no borders. And, you know, it is short-sighted to say, I only care if me and my family get vaccinated. If these other people choose not to, that's not my problem. Well, the the reality is, is that it is your problem and you will come in contact with these individuals, either through their roles in the service industry or even if they're sharing an office space with you. They may not be for example, a financial analyst sitting right beside you, but they may be the person you're sharing a table with in your workplace cafeteria who serves in some other role. And so collectively, it serves us all to try to encourage and promote vaccination of everyone. And, you know, I have young children. And as we know, the current vaccines are approved for ages 16 and up. And so, I mistakenly thought to myself, well, you know, once I'm able to get vaccinated, we can finally go on a vacation and I don't have to worry. And then I thought, well, not the kids, really can't. Right. the kids, the yes, kids. because, yeah. you know, I have, I have uh, young children. And so I have to count on the adults in the situation yeah. to protect my children. 
while I have you here, what are your thoughts on the new variants of COVID-19 that have emerged? And how can all of us, especially our most vulnerable communities, continue to stay safe? Yeah, so the new variants are causing considerable concern. And when we saw these spikes happening in the Los Angeles area, uh, Early on, suspicions from public health professionals there was that this was possibly the new, more contagious strain that we had been warned about from the UK. And it turned out that that is what was circulating there. Um, Watching that situation develop, particularly over the holidays in the Los Angeles region of the country, caused me great alarm and reminded me of the terror of what we all felt in April last year watching what was happening in New York City. And I asked at that time, are we on the edge of seeing that again here in Chicago? And are we not doing what we need to do to protect ourselves for when that variant hits? Now it has hit in Chicago. I think as we're tracking data, we can start to track to see how much of it is this new variant and when that one will take over as the primary strain. And the reality is that Our strategies to prevent that don't necessarily differ with one exception, and that is the current recommendation by, uh, I I heard it coming from Dr. Fauci, um, about possibly wearing two masks when you're out to try to protect yourself. So right now, we still only have the same tools. Moderna and Pfizer both indicate that their vaccine is effective against these two new variants. We can expect that any virus is going to mutate the longer it is out there in the population. So our attention right now needs to remain on reinforcing the basic public health measures of distancing and mask wearing, and possibly wearing two masks when one is in a crowded space, as well as Um, vaccination. And I think the faster we can put those pieces into place, the sooner we can cut off the rapid transmission of this new strain. Is there anything else that you're seeing out there that you want to add? You know, a large proportion of people who do contract COVID will do fine. Um, But And some smaller proportion and shrinking proportion is going to die. Thankfully, we're getting better at treating it. But, you know, there's this group in the middle of people who don't recover. And what we don't know yet, we have seen some preliminary data that long haul COVID is more common among individuals with pre-existing risk factors. It appears to be more common in women. It appears to be more common among individuals who are obese or have other chronic diseases at baseline. Given that we know that these characteristics are more likely to occur in um, underrepresented minorities and lower socioeconomic populations, we have to really consider what the potential long-term social and economic implications are if individuals experience long haul COVID. You know, it's one thing for me in a salaried position with disability coverage that if I was experiencing extreme long haul COVID, I could take time off of work and not lose my source of income. But we stand to potentially widen disparities for those individuals who are paid hourly and who can no longer work because they contract long haul COVID. So, you know, for people who think, well, maybe I could just get COVID and get it over with since most people will live Long haul COVID can really cause significant financial implications in the long run. And these are people we're going now on eight, nine, 10 months of them still experiencing symptoms and they don't have the virus active in their body anymore. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's the really scary thing. And there are no treatments for it. People are exploring different factors, but it's hard to know who's going to end up with long haul COVID. And that's a really scary thing that that can serve to widen disparities ultimately. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mercedes Carnathon. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening to the show. You can always head to our website, feinberg.northwestern.edu, to listen to past episodes of the show, claim CME credit, and subscribe. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your shows so you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening. 